It's not just about conserving what's there now, it's about restoring our wild salmon to their former glory. Our wild Atlantic salmon are built into the very fabric of Scottish history and civilization. For thousands of years, they were considered a limitless natural resource. These gleaming, strong and determined creatures travel in shoals across the Atlantic Ocean back and forth in search of food, returning every year to the same gravelly pools that they were born in to spawn and kickstart the next generation. Now, in as little as a few decades, they have dwindled in numbers to near extinction because of human activities. The jeopardy facing wild Atlantic salmon is desperate and very real. In every stage of their life cycle, they are indicators of the health of ecosystems from streams to rivers and to the open ocean. Salmon truly are the king of fish. We have to listen to them, understand them and act for them. The underwater world of our wild salmon may be out of sight, but it is not out with our influence. We can all work to protect and conserve these amazing creatures. And if we all come together, we can allow them to thrive once again. This film celebrates our wild salmon and the amazing people that strive to ensure that their habitat is as good as it once was and to keep it that way for our children and future generations. We explore just some of the many pressures faced by our wild salmon in Scotland today and how we can all make a difference to their survival and to the wider ecosystems they depend on. Fisheries Management Scotland exists to help take care of our rivers and the fish and fisheries that depend on them. Our members are Scotland's District Salmon Fishery Boards, the River Tweed Commission and Rivers and Fisheries Trusts. Together with fishery owners and anglers, our members work to understand, protect and conserve our wild salmon. Wild salmon populations face a wide range of pressures, some at sea and many others within freshwater and coastal environments. On top of this, climate change is threatening their very existence in the wild. Some pressures, particularly on the high seas, are out with our control, but with the right support, there are many pressures that we can address now, and some of these are the focus of this film. Our wild salmon need free access to cold, clean water. We actually don't need to manage fish. What we need to do is manage pressures and people to make sure we provide our wild salmon with the best conditions to flourish. If we get that right, the fish will look after themselves. We have time to make a difference if we take decisive action now. Fish farming in Scotland started in the late 60s and farmed salmon is now Scotland's biggest food export. There are more than 200 fish farms across the country and the number of farmed fish in our coastal environment vastly outnumbers the number of wild salmon and sea trout returning to our rivers. Parasitic sea lice from Scotland's fish farming industry pose a direct threat to our wild salmon. Sea lice are naturally occurring parasites which affect wild and farmed salmon and sea trout. But if the numbers of lice on a fish are too high, it can lead to stress and even death. The vast numbers of farmed fish being reared along our coast act as hosts for these parasites. When things go wrong, high levels of lice can cause significant damage to our wild salmon and sea trout populations. We're specifically here today because there's been a huge outbreak of lice on the nearby farm and we wanted to see what impact that's having on the wild fish. I'm really passionate about trying to find these solutions and make our data that we've collected today, make it mean something, make it mean something not only to me but to people in the Scottish Government um, and to people working on the fish farm. What we really need is a robust regulatory system so we're not just relying on the goodwill of the fish farm companies but we actually have some way of enforcing these regulations. Realistic lice targets 
which are based on protecting wild fish. At the minute, all of the lice targets are just for farmed fish. They're not at all based on protecting wild fish. And we need that system to change and we need Scottish Government to implement that. If people came out here today and saw these lice on these fish, they would be sickened by it, you know, and they would want to do something to improve it because it just shouldn't be like that. You know, in such a natural, beautiful place, we have to be able to do better. And I genuinely think we can, I just think that we need some support. Farmed salmon pose another threat to our endangered wild fish when they escape from their cages. Escaped salmon can compete with wild fish for habitat and food. And if the escaped fish breed with our wild salmon, they can change the genetic makeup of a species already under threat. This can affect the very viability of our wild populations. There have been major escapes from cages along our coasts and in Scotland's freshwater lochs. Wild fish are great at surviving in the wild. They've adapted to it over thousands of years. Farm fish, on the other hand, are great at surviving in a farm environment when they're being fed and cared for. But when they're out in a wild environment, they're not great at surviving. So the term for this is they are less fit than their wild counterparts. The open cage aquaculture that we have here is not used in many areas. And we would like the production here moved on land so that the, the industry can still continue to operate. It won't have a major effect on, on the industry, but our, our salmon populations all will be protected. At the moment, the emphasis has, has been on us to uh, prove that there is a problem rather than the aquaculture industry demonstrating that there isn't an issue. So we believe that's a completely unfair burden on ourselves and uh, SSE and other operators. We had a, a rather large escape, more than 48,000 salmon escaped uh, in August last year into the Perth of Clyde and very rapidly started to enter the Ayrshire rivers, uh, the Clyde system, some Argyll rivers. And that's very worrying. We have to make sure that this integration monitoring continues next year and, and for a few years thereafter, just to make sure that we are capturing uh, examples of integration if they are occurring. Not all pressures that salmon face are necessarily man-made. Our wild salmon are prey to many predator species, including other fish, fish-eating birds, and mammals such as seals and dolphins. In light of the decline in wild salmon numbers, predation is increasingly recognised as an important pressure. The journey to sea from fresh water is a particularly vulnerable time, and any young salmon lost to predation at this stage will have a direct effect on the number of salmon returning to our rivers. Of course, returning adults are also subject to predation, and fisheries managers are working to reduce this pressure. It's our priority to get as many healthy wild salmon to sea as possible. We know that predation of salmon can be significant in our rivers and coastal waters. The main predators of salmon are fish-eating birds, mammals and other fish species. In coastal waters, adult salmon are eaten by seals and dolphins. A small number of seals are salmon specialists that swim many miles up rivers to feed. Adult salmon resting in pools prior to spawning are very easy prey in these circumstances. Predation in rivers often takes place where salmon are held back in their natural migration, for example by man-made barriers. The best way to address predation in these circumstances is to remove that barrier. Addressing predation of salmon is challenging because both predator and prey are protected species. In some circumstances, predators can be removed under license, but ultimately we want to see the rapid development of effective, non-lethal methods to protect our wild salmon. Fisheries managers are working hard to get the right balance between the conservation of salmon, a species in crisis, and the conservation of these other predators. Protecting our wild salmon from predation is something that we can do to look after these iconic fish. Salmon hatcheries have been used in Scotland since the 1800s to breed and grow salmon in a controlled environment, initially with the purpose of increasing numbers of salmon in rivers. The process is relatively simple. Adult salmon are removed from the rivers before they spawn naturally and eggs are fertilised and grown artificially in specially designed tanks. After a period of time in the hatchery environment, the fertilised eggs or young fish 
are then released into rivers. For some people, adding fish into rivers to increase numbers is an obvious answer to declining populations of wild salmon. In recent decades, the problems associated with the use of hatcheries are much better understood. The process of artificially rearing fish can result in fish that are poorly adapted for life in the wild. Importantly, these negative characteristics can also be passed on to future generations. The capture of adult fish for use in the hatchery also removes fish that would otherwise have spawned in the river. This has led some people to conclude that rearing young salmon in hatcheries should never be done under any circumstances. There are times when stocking can make sense, but there are many others where this can do more harm than good to a species already under threat. Like a lot of people, I see that the numbers of salmon have gone down over time. It's happened all across Scotland, it's happened across the North Atlantic. This is, this is an issue. Unfortunately, hatcheries aren't necessarily the answer. There are different types of hatcheries, and on one side you have mitigation, which is necessary. On the other side, you have enhancement. In the case of mitigation stalking, the work that we do on the Conan, it is heavily, heavily built on science. We've spent years perfecting what we do. We take every possible precaution to avoid any sort of negative genetic effects. We only stalk in areas where naturally fish cannot spawn. Enhancement, on the other hand, I completely understand why people would want those hatcheries to exist. There is a desire to increase the number of fish in the river. A lot of the time that can be done by other means, habitat restoration, removing barriers to migration, improving water quality, tree planting to reduce temperatures. There's lots of options and hatcheries, although they have their place, may not necessarily factor into improving the numbers of salmon going forward. We need to start looking at them as a requirement in some cases, but not the answer in all cases. Our wild salmon rely on cold, clean water. The way that we use the land and fresh water can have a huge bearing on water quality. Where water quality is poor, it can affect growth and survival of salmon. Robust regulation to reduce or eliminate pollution is required to ensure that these impacts are addressed. Activities which affect water quality can be often associated with particular types of land use, such as runoff from farmland or forestry activities. Where livestock are allowed to enter rivers, this can also damage the river bed and add significant quantities of silt and animal waste into the water. Across a large area, these activities can have a big impact on important habitat for salmon. This is called diffuse pollution. Forestry is a major issue for rivers in Dumfries and Galloway. It was heavily forested in the 1960s and 70s with blanket Sitka spruce plantations. These were planted without any real environmental controls at the time and in particular there was heavy drainage of a lot of the upland peatland areas and planting right up to the edges of, of rivers. You can see some of these drains are really, really deep, you know, well, well over a metre deep to try and dry out the ground enough to be able to get the soils and that really really damages the, the, the peat but the, the thing that we really recognised is just how much poor water quality was coming off these damaged peatland bogs and how quickly you can actually improve water quality if you restore these bogs. Pollution can also come from a specific source such as a sewage outfall. This is called point source pollution. Public awareness of the extent of pollution entering our rivers was heightened during the recent pandemic, but it's important to understand that pollution has big implications for our wild salmon, as well as our wider quality of life. So one of the, the main problems we see in Ayrshire, on this river anyway, on the River Ayr, is impacts arising from historic and more recent open cast mining. And these shafts fill up with uh, groundwater, rainwater, and um, then overflow back to the river. And what we've got here is iron rich water. And you can see the iron precipitating out of the water on the bed where it reacts with oxygen and, and gives you this rust-like colour. So we've got problems right from the source of the river um, that go all the way down it. And further downstream we saw green, murky looking water. And that's a direct result of this iron input and all the others, and there are plenty of others. So below the surface, everything is very, very black. And that's just because there's no oxygen gets to it. Um, and that's a problem for spawning 
areas and spawning gravels. It's very frustrating because we don't have any solutions here and nobody seems to be willing to, to, to help. So pollution can affect the quality of our water. We also need to ensure that there is the right amount of water for our wild salmon to thrive. Climate change is predicted to result in warmer, drier summers in Scotland. In 2018, more than two thirds of Scotland's rivers experienced temperatures that would cause stress for our wild salmon. This was also associated with a period of significant water scarcity. Too little water can impact migration, reduce the amount of habitat available to salmon and can lead to mortality. We're here at the iconic River Spey down at Cregelachy to look at the low summer flows that we're currently experiencing. One of the significant problems that we have here on the Spey is the very substantial volumes of water that are diverted out of the catchment to generate hydroelectricity. What we found is that over the 80 or so years that these hydro schemes have been in place, which in their time were feats of modern engineering, they have denuded the sand and shingle substrate of the Spey catchment from the groundwater resupply that it desperately needs to sustain the flows during summer low levels such as this. All of this means that we have less water flowing down this river to sustain the Atlantic salmon. We're calling on the Scottish Government and SEPA and Nature Scott and the hydroelectric power generators to reappraise their approach to water resource management and instead of diverting all of this water out of the catchment, to instead rewater some of the upper spay tributaries and give the sand and shingle substrate a chance to have its groundwater supplies replenished so that in turn they can support and sustain this river during the climate emergency we all face. Large-scale hydroelectric power generation started in Scotland during the 1950s and 60s. Large dams were built which resulted in salmon and spawning habitat being lost and in most cases the dams limit the ability of salmon to move up or downstream past these structures. Ensuring free movement of fish has been a priority for fisheries managers for many years, working with the hydro operators and the Scottish Environment Protection Agency to find solutions. In some cases where passage can't be achieved, more creative solutions are required. What we do at the moment to mitigate is we use a trap like this rotary screw trap here and catch fish before they get into Loch Shin. We then will tag some but we'll drive them down below the dams and release them to continue on to their seaward migration. There has been some successes in terms of for example, restoring uh, salmon populations to the FIAG here. But there are other parts of the catchment where we, we don't have that success yet. But we will have that success, I believe, uh, if we can manage to get proper equipment and proper regulation of the industries that operate elsewhere in this catchment. So there, there is a really a golden opportunity, an absolute golden opportunity to do the best thing for the fish population, to correct a lot of these problems that we have here that have existed for 50 or 60 years and to put it right once and for all. This is one of the gravel introduction sites on the Blackwater of Dee. We've identified four different locations where we had good access on the road here and that we could get into particularly faster sections of the water because the whole theory of this introduction of gravel is to not to actually create the spawning beds or the finished product of what we want, but to allow the river processes to do that themselves. Lovely stuff, you can see here, sort of mix of gravels, pebbles, there's a few cobbles in here as well. There is some smaller finds as well, but this is all stuff that, that this river is missing. The, the dam's been there for 90 years, so we haven't had any movement like this going into the river, apart from leaving the river for, for 90 years. This is a good example here of what the river looks like below the dam. You can see there's next to no small substrates, it's pretty much just bedrock and a few larger boulders. We have a wide number of, of partners that have come together 
we, we don't think 500 tonnes is going to sort out the problem. It will have a localised impact, but we're talking about nearly 20 kilometres of this river. And you can see here, you're talking about 15, 20 metres wide. Nearly all of this is really, really good juvenile production area, which should have trout and salmon in it. This could be the real catalyst of, of returning the fish back, back to this catch. If I can do something here to actually bring these back, then personally, that, 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 that's a win-win and a real driver from, from my point of view. With wild salmon numbers at crisis point, the illegal removal of even a small number of fish can have a big impact. Fish poaching often involves serious organised criminal activity and is a nationally recognised wildlife crime. To deal with this, Scotland has a network of fisheries enforcement officers known as water bailiffs, who have legal powers to tackle the illegal taking of wild salmon and sea trout. When you arrive at somebody to get over the first interface of the bailiff and the person on the river bank, key is you need to know what they're doing before you ask them what they're doing the bit in the bank where they've hidden the two fish and then let them verbally put their foot right in it. Oh, I've caught nothing today. No, right. Then you know you're on to a winning streak. Hi, right, so we've got some of the articles and instruments that we've seized over the years. Uh, here are just some examples for you. I have a piece of tin foil here. Wrap the tin foil round about the hooks. Lower that down into the water. Sinks to the bottom. You're watching off the bridge. Whenever the, the tin foil disappears in the blackness of the water, the perpetrator of this crime pulls it up and the fish is impaled on the bottom of the, one of the trebles. And uh, see the, the hooks here, pretty devastating. This is a gaff seized from our catchment. Um, basically consists of a bent piece of metal with a barb on it. Debbie, if you put your hand out like a fish's tail, and I would see this down under the water, and I'm sliding the snare over the fish's tail when it's over, I merely pull it, I'm not going to pull it too hard or Debbie will lose her wrist here. Um, as the fish captured and it's wriggling about and you can pull it out of the water. This is a static net. This is what they call a gill net. And this sits across a river like a curtain. And the idea here is that fish swim into the net and are caught. It's very indiscriminate. In these nets I've seen porpoise, I've seen protected species of bird, as well as salmon and sea trout. Very, very destructive. And saying indiscriminate gill netting. There's a harbour of porpoise. As we have seen, fish poaching can have a major impact on our wild salmon and sea trout. Bailiffs across Scotland, working with Police Scotland and angling associations, are doing a fantastic job of protecting our rivers, but they need our help. Fish poaching is one of the most widespread forms of wildlife crime, but the fines imposed when cases reach court are too low to act as a suitable deterrent. We need to ensure that the penalties for this illegal activity reflect the damage inflicted on salmon populations. There are also significant resourcing issues in some parts of Scotland. It's crucial that funding is available to make sure that fish poaching can be tackled wherever it occurs. The movement of young salmon from freshwater to the sea is a sensitive time where salmon are particularly susceptible to pressures that they may encounter, such as activities in the marine and coastal environments, including installation and operation of marine renewable energy developments, harbour dredging and maintenance. So over the last four years, we've been tracking the juvenile salmon smolts as they do their river migration and make it to sea which begins here at Aberdeen Harbour. In one year in 2018 we found that over a quarter, in fact 28% of those smolts never made it through that final leg of the journey. 
The reason being that we lost so many smolts in 2018 appears to be that the annual maintenance dredging that's carried out by the Harbour Board every year happened in that year to coincide with the exact time that our tagged smolts were moving through the harbour. Our concerns were expressed in, in actual data and, and facts and that seemed to make quite a difference to the licensing team who granted a protection window for the smolt so that no dredging would be carried out during that critical smolt migration time. So for the last three years, we've had smolt protection during this really critical final end piece of their journey as they go out to sea. Given the crisis facing our Atlantic salmon stocks, everything really needs to be done to protect them which is why it's an unfortunate situation that the precautionary principle isn't applied more. So in this case, we actually had to prove that there was an impact on the salmon stocks to prevent damaging work being done. Our wild salmon are threatened by climate change. We all know that we urgently need to reduce greenhouse gases, but we also need to make sure that the rapid expansion of renewable energy doesn't create new pressures for our fish. Marine renewables have the potential to impact salmon through physical damage from underwater turbines, noise effects during construction and operation, and through electromagnetic fields, which could disrupt migratory behaviour. We're working with the Scottish Government and NatureScot to identify information gaps and prioritise work to address interactions between wild salmon and marine renewables. This work needs to be funded and progress quickly to understand and address these issues. Invasive non-native species are non-native animals or plants that can spread and cause damage to the environment. These species are a big threat to our countryside, our native wildlife, our economy, and in some cases directly to our health. Many of these invasive species are able to spread via our rivers and watercourses and threaten the wildlife and landscapes of our rivers and lochs. In partnership with the Scottish Invasive Species Initiative, fisheries managers, volunteers and communities are working hard to put in place sustainable, long-term solutions to invasive species management. This is giant hogweed. It's an invasive non-native species to Scotland um, and it forms quite dense monoculture stands where nothing else grows. None of our native riverside plants will grow. Um, you start seeing it in the spring where you've got little green leaves but they're quite deeply cut in and they have a purple line in the middle and the dense, the thick stems are speckled with purple and then as the season goes on they'll shoot up um, up to 10-15 feet and you'll see big white flowers with lots and lots of up to 10,000 seeds per flower head which then dry and scatter as the plant dies back in the autumn. As the seeds ripen they are carried by wind and by water down the watercourse. So quite often you'll get areas where the floodwaters come up and then as they die back and slow down, the seeds will all drop out and you'll get really dense stands in the areas where the floodwaters have been. So you can see here in this dense patch of hogweed that you've got the big flowering heads, but you've also got one and two year old plants in here. And all of these plants contain the sap that can cause burns. It's not just the bigger flowering heads. The River Don Board and Trust have decided that we have to eradicate the problem here, partly because of the effect it has on the river itself and the banks, but also because of the horrendous injuries which are caused to members of the public who get burnt by giant hogweed. We're determined to eradicate this problem as quickly as possible. To do that, we will need the support of not only politicians and councils, but also the general public. Currently on the URI, the treatment for giant hogweed is carried out individually by landowners. So you'll get some areas where the landowners have treated big areas and then maybe their next door neighbour has treated nothing. So you can see quite clearly areas with no or very little giant hogweed next to areas where you get big stands of these flower heads um, where they haven't been treated for whatever reason. If we tackle it now, we can make a difference in a few years time. Um, if we don't take any action, if we leave it as it is, the problem will only get worse and become a bigger risk.
In 2017, large numbers of Pacific pink salmon were captured across the UK. Pink salmon are not native to Scotland and are likely to have strayed from populations introduced to some Russian rivers in the 1960s. Pink salmon have a distinct two-year life cycle and appeared again in Scotland in 2019 and 2021. Fisheries managers have had to react quickly to this new and evolving threat facing wild Atlantic salmon. Yeah, so basically once, once the pinks have been in a system for a while, they've got quite distinguishing features with a humpback and things on the, the males. And it's when they, when they come in a river to start with and their bars are silver, there's, there's some people find it quite difficult, so we need to get out there to show them exactly what features to look for. So one of the biggest risks is likely to be that the pink salmon may bring with them disease or parasites, something that our own native salmon aren't familiar with and aren't able to defend themselves against. And that's happened time and time again, you know, throughout the world when non-native species are introduced into a new environment. The other issue with pink salmon is the fact we, know, we now know that they can spawn in Scottish rivers and that their offspring will hatch. And then that's more competition, more pressure on our own juvenile fish, which are you know, really facing crisis points at the moment. Our wild salmon need free access to cold, clean water. Barriers preventing free movement of fish come in all shapes and sizes, from large-scale industrial dams to much smaller structures such as pipes or tunnels under roads, paths or railways. Some have historical significance, but many are now redundant as their original use is no longer relevant. All barriers can prevent or delay our wild salmon from returning to their natural spawning grounds. As salmon numbers dwindle, the removal of these barriers is one of the simplest and most urgent ways we can help our wild salmon recover. The Scottish Environment Protection Agency is investing considerable sums of public money in addressing barriers to fish migration. Fisheries Management Scotland supports this work and many of our members are actively involved in these projects. There's an ambitious target to address nearly 250 barriers by 2027. We'll continue to work to ensure that the Scottish Government and SEPA deliver this vital work on schedule for the benefit of our wild salmon. One of the most important tasks for fisheries managers is to ensure that the freshwater habitat is as good as it can be. In the light of climate change and rising river temperatures, this work is vital to ensure that our wild salmon have access to cold, clean water for years to come. Here we have some examples of inspiring projects that are making a real difference for our wild salmon. Rivers like the Grey Iron used to have trees along the river bank for thousands of years. It's us that's got rid of them, so we're just reinstating what used to be there along the, along the river banks to help shade those rivers and stop them getting too high. Because if we're getting 27.5 degrees water temperature now, What's it going to be like with global warming in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 50 years? And one of the things you can do when you've got a uniform bit of river is to add a bit of complexity to it. And the natural way to do that is to add what we call large woody structure, which is just basically whole trees dug into the, the bed or the bank of the river so that they're secure and they don't wash away in the flood. If you put these in, they mimic what would naturally be happening in the river. This part of, of the Beltie, Easter Beltie, was canalised, was made completely straight. In fact, it was the straightest bit of river I've ever seen in my life uh, back in the 1860s to run alongside the railway line. No salmon ever spawned in this reach of the, the barn because it was canalised and it didn't have the right flows and the, and the right substrate. So it was a really it was, a, it was a bit of the Belty burn that really wasn't functioning uh, naturally. So a project was uh, developed that included all these linked wetlands in a meandering section of river. It was a huge earth moving job to do this. This is a 10 hectare site, so this is quite significant uh, restoration. And the icing on the cake for this story was the, the bit that you can see behind me, the nice riffle with the gravel. The diggers were actually still on site, they hadn't been moved off the site yet, but in November salmon and sea trout were seen spawning here and in total we recorded 15 reds 
in this section of the Belty. So the first time since 1860 probably that salmon have actually used this stretch to spawn in. Now I kept telling people that these habitat projects will take years to basically show dividends, but the salmon proved me wrong and came in and spawned almost right on top of the works that we've done. I think that is fantastic. We find ourselves at a crucial tipping point where we need to act urgently to save our wild salmon for future generations. Fisheries managers, fisheries owners and anglers are doing their part and we're building real momentum for change, working with our partners in the Missing Salmon Alliance. The Scottish Government has recognised the need to support this vital work. We now need urgent, coordinated action from government and regulators and we need industry and developers to step up to the plate and do more to ensure that their activities do not harm our precious wild salmon. Our magnificent wild salmon have fought their way up our rivers and fired our imaginations for thousands of years. Despite all the pressures we've heard about, it's not too late to make a real difference. So what can you do to help? The fisheries management community across Scotland are giving their all to help protect our rivers. This work does not just benefit salmon, but improves and enhances our natural environment. It's not just about conserving what's there now, it's about restoring our wild salmon to their former glory. Get out and support these efforts in whatever way you can. Volunteer, share our message and help others to understand and cherish the amazing life under the surface of our rivers. Together, we can save our wild salmon.